Our hymn of praise is number 400 at Calvary. <coughs> together our hymn of preparation, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Thank you. 
this morning with a fable and um, sort of maybe more of a parable anyway but a story anyway a uh, very old old story that says once there lived a very famous sculptor and this man was so gifted in his craft that his sculptures uh, looked so lifelike he was such such a gifted sculptor and as he became popular, he became commissioned by kings all over the land to do work for them if they needed a statue made. And in time, he had become very prideful in his very good work. One night, the sculptor had a dream, and in it, he was told that after 15 days, death would come to take him. Terrified of dying, the sculptor had an idea. He set to work on preparing nine different statues of his own likeness. He worked night and day on these uh, nine statues uh, for 14 days. And when he heard death coming on the 15th day, he took his place amongst the other nine. Death was astonished to see ten likenesses of this uh, very famous sculptor instead of just the real sculptor. Which of the one is real, if any, Death thought to himself. Well, the sculptor was so calm and confident in his abilities that he barely moved as he breathed and stood perfectly still. The sculptor felt a beam of pride go through his heart when he entertained the thought that he may actually defeat death through his brilliant sculpting. After a few moments of pacing back and forth amongst the sculptors, the, the, uh, the statues, death analyzed each one for the slightest hint of light, thinking there has to be some kind of a trick going on here. The devil then, or death I should say, uh, had a devious smile come across his face and he said out loud, very impressive work if I do say so myself. Why these sculpt sculptures look absolutely perfect except for this one mistake over here. And hearing those words, the sculptor, who was unable to bear the least blemish in his work, stepped forward, and he said, where is the fault? <laughs> and death caught him and said, here. <laughs> the statues were faultless, but the sculptor was caught because of his pride. That's what we're going to talk about this morning is pride and as uh, we are going to continue our look at the devil through the writings of the Apostle Paul. And this morning we will look at Paul's first letter to Timothy and uh, we'll be looking in chapter 3 where Paul gives Timothy uh, some specific characteristics 
that should describe a church leader. And we'll just read the first seven verses of this uh, chapter. If you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 839, although um, that page number doesn't actually appear since it's the first you know, page of the uh, book, but look for 838 on the left side, and then it'll be on the right. So reading from 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, the word of the Lord says, Here is a trustworthy saying, If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. The Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. The question this morning that we ask is, what do we really mean when we use the word pride? Does this mean that I can't feel good about myself if I get a good grade on a test in school? Or even, am I allowed to feel good whatever I win at a board game? Or is it something more than that? Well, if we look at the definition of pride, we basically have a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. The thing about pride is that it can have both good effects and bad. There is a good pride out there whenever you see a person who takes humble pleasure in their own good abilities. And you see, pride can actually drive a person to be the best that they can be at a certain task simply because they want to glorify God. Take uh, NFL quarterback Drew Brees, for example. When asked what drives him to compete at the highest level, Brees, who is a born-again Christian, once said, I think it's pride. That encompasses so many things. But in my mind, pride is that inner discipline, that inner voice to just be the hardest working guy on the field, as tough as you can be, to give everything you can to your team, to not be a selfish player, to fulfill your role, to fight for your teammates, to be a great leader, not only on the field, but off the field. End quote. The way that Drew Brees describes it, pride is what drives him to be the best he can be for the benefit of others, being namely his teammates, more so than himself. On the other hand, pride can have very negative effects. Now I know not everyone here is necessarily a, sp a fan of sports, but in the sports world we do see a lot of examples of pride out there. Uh, both good and bad. So we'll briefly look at professional golfer Tiger Woods now. When it came out in the media several years ago that Tiger Woods was involved in an extramarital affair, Woods admitted that personal pride played a large role in his actions. He said, and I quote, I knew my actions were wrong, but I convinced myself that the normal rules did not apply. I never thought about who I was hurting. I thought I could get away with whatever I wanted to. I felt that I had worked hard my entire life and deserved to enjoy all the temptations around me. I felt I was entitled. Thanks to money and fame, I didn't have to go far to find them. I was wrong. I was foolish. I don't get to play by different rules. The same boundaries that apply to everyone 
apply to me. I brought this shame on myself. End quote. This is what the Apostle Paul warns us about in his first letter to Timothy, talking about individuals who aspire to a position of church leadership, but we can't just throw this aside and say, well, I'm not currently on church council, so that doesn't apply to me. Because all believers, people in the church, should aspire to serve God in any way possible. And if you've ever read our church constitution, it says in there that if any of our church uh, council members cannot fulfill their responsibilities, another member should be chosen in order to f uh, fill that uh, council position uh, for the remainder of the term. So, Paul lists certain criteria for a church leader, included or not being a drunkard, being faithful, being able to manage your family properly, things like that. And then in verse 6 he says, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. These words should make us ask this question, what caused the judgment of the devil? That we're concerned and other people could be under that same judgment. The Bible tells us that above all, the devil was condemned because of his pride. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 14, which we had actually looked at uh, recently in our uh, Wednesday night Bible study, we read these words. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you had said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the high heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This shows us how Satan was the embodiment of pride. We see this when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. He actually offered to give up his control that he currently and still has over all the kingdoms of the world if Jesus would only for a brief moment bow down in front of him and give him worship. It's not just a small nuance in the story. It shows us how far he would go to feed his pride, that he would give up all of his control that he has over this world just in the name of pride. Satan, being prideful as he is, he tries to influence, of course, people in the church uh, to follow his lead. It can happen to anyone. But Paul sees more so of a responsibility or a possibility of this happening to recent or new converts to the faith. And Paul doesn't go into an explanation of why this is the case, but I think it's because it's rather obvious. Uh, we know that the devil is constantly attacking believers, trying to get them to trip up and make them stumble in their walk with Jesus. So it's really about your ego. And it certainly doesn't happen, only happen to new converts. It can happen to people who have been in ministry their whole lives. It reminds me of a story about a specific preacher who uh, you know, gave the sermon and then uh, as they uh, left the church for the day, he was shaking hands as we typically do. And one of the people in his congregation shook his hand and said, you know, Pastor, you must be smarter than Einstein. And then he went and left and didn't explain what he meant. So Pastor just took this as a compliment. Wow, I you know, must have really touched him today and felt some pride this coming that coming week and the next week, uh, whenever he went back to church, he uh, went to the man and he said, remember last week when you said I was smarter than Einstein? He says, could you explain what you meant by that? He says, I took that as a great compliment. And the man said, you know, I have heard that only about maybe 10 out of 100 people can understand Einstein, but nobody can understand you. <laughs> mm. 
it can happen to anybody, even you know pastors who have been in the ministry for years and years, but Paul's talking about the newly converted who have not had the experience or as much experience of managing their feelings of pride and vanity, and therefore they would be more likely to become prideful in certain circumstances. After all, it uh, wouldn't be wouldn't it be natural for a person uh, who, to accept Christ into their life, and uh, maybe just a month or two later, uh, the church wants them to be a leader now? They must really think that they're a great person and the church really needs me because, you know, now that I'm here, we can set things straight and all these kind of things. So the newly converted is, in a word, immature in their faith. They're not used to giving glory to God in certain circumstances as often as they should. And maybe they may not realize how keeping glory to themselves reflects poorly on the church. See, this is a natural human response. And believers in Christ need to learn how to manage their feelings of pride. Believers should always be giving glory to God first because it can cause big problems if they don't. In uh, the passage that we looked at in 1 Timothy... Uh, Paul makes some other references to the devil in there. Specifically in verse 8, he says he must also have a good reputation with outsiders, that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Now this is the devil's trap, though, to disgrace those in the church. And the list of criteria that Paul sets forth is designed to weed out these individuals who are more likely to disgrace the church and disqualify them from positions of leadership, at least until they mature in their faith. Now, what I, what I am really getting at and mean is that how do you suppose it looks in the community if a church leader gets caught drinking and uh, being abusive and allows their children to just run wild at home and then people are just going to think, you know, I can't believe that the church allows someone like that to be in a position of leadership. I mean, they can't even control their own home. They can't control their own urges. So why would they be allowed to do that? And therefore, you know, they see that their kids don't obey and respect them, yet this person is going to uh, command obe obedience and respect from, from the congregation and other people. And, you know, I wouldn't blame someone for thinking of it that way because uh, they really would be justified in doing so. In that position, the devil would be in a prime position to succeed because the man it would be at a high risk to disgrace the church through his actions. It is inevitable that some will disgrace themselves through pride, and that's bad enough when it happens, but it's even worse to drag the church through the mud as well, as everything you do is a representation of the church that you are associated with. Here's an example to explain what I mean. Now, biblical example understood, but back in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, we read about King Nebuchadnezzar. He, at one time, was the most powerful king in the world. He was the ruler of almighty Babylon, which uh, is more or less current-day Iraq and Iran in that uh, general area of the world. And in chapter 4 of Daniel, it talks about one day being very prideful um, of all that he had built, his massive kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The Bible then tells us that a voice from heaven came down and it said, Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. That was the voice of God who said that this mighty king would have to live like this 
uh, humiliated for about seven years, soaked wet with dew every morning, uh, his hair like eagle's feathers, and nails like bird claws because he wouldn't be able to properly trim them. It was a pitiful picture of a once prideful man. Now, that's the Old Testament. That was a long time ago. How about in the 21st century? I'm sure most, if not all of you, probably remember this picture from 2003. Saddam Hussein, murderous dictator of Iraq, was on the run that year as the world's most wanted man. American troops had invaded Iraq and on December 13th of 2003, our soldiers found this former dictator who once lived among 20 lavish palaces hiding in a six by eight foot hole in the ground. This man who was once obsessed with personal hygiene was found cowering dirty and unshaved with a bushy beard and matted hair. Hussein never returned to the luxury that he was accustomed to as three years later he would be executed by hanging for the crimes he committed. Imagine the pride that he must have felt at one time. And if there was something he wanted, he got it. it worse yet, if he wanted someone killed because maybe they encroached on his uh, authority, he would have them killed. This is a description of the extreme lengths that pride can take an individual. Only few people take it to that extent. Most people's pride is in a much more subtle tone. In sports, again, you have uh, people who know, feel that they have to come out on top every game that they play. Or maybe in school, they just have to get the best grade on the test every single time. Or in business, you have to get that big account uh, more than anyone else and prove that you are the best. And behind that drive to be the best at any cost, we find the enemy, the devil. And I haven't said the name devil too much in this message because he's known uh, more by his influence than anything else. Remember that pride is a high opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, and so forth. But I'd like to close this morning by putting it this way, that based on this definition, the only one in the universe who cannot be guilty of pride is God himself. God doesn't suffer from pride because his superiority is greater than anyone and anything else. It was the devil who exalted himself over God where he doesn't belong and the punishment that awaits him is an eternal one. On the other hand, when Jesus was on the earth, he taught us the value of humility and that is really what Paul is getting at in his letter to Timothy. If you are a believer in Christ, you want to avoid anything that would remotely suggest that you are the least bit prideful because the, our intent as being a light in a dark world should be that we are a reflection of God, the one who offered the gift of salvation. But even so, we still have to watch out because when things seem to be going well for us, that little thought can enter into our minds at any moment where I'm getting pretty good at living the Christian life. I'm remembering things in Bible study and, you know, they're calling on me to pray. and It can be anything like that. And the next thing you know, you've committed that sin of pride because you are now taking credit for your success rather than giving that credit to God. Pride is always there trying to weasel its way in. And it's the same thing that led to the judgment of the devil in the first place. So the last thing that we want to be done is to be labeled among him. Instead, we need to make the constant effort to give the honor and glory to God because the Bible tells us every good and perfect gift is from above. So let's pray that pride would not stain our character 
as we strive to be good representatives of Jesus Christ. Let us now bow our heads and go to him in prayer. This is number 425, Faith is the Victory. Mm -hmm. 